Well, owing to my friendship with Owen Stevens, I got to participate in the America's Cup. I was the bow man of this uh, told me of the uh, Columbia in 1958, and I sailed these boats for 25 years and was in four of the America's Cup uh, matches, which was a great thrill to do. Captain Nat was the inventor in America of uh, catamarans, and this is his patent model, which we have on view upstairs. And this was so early, 1876, there was no high-speed photography, so they could only take a picture of his boat in a flat calm, like it was here this morning. But that's a picture of, the, uh, of a later uh, replica sailing, and uh, that's a picture of my father sailing it. And I feel a kinship with this boat, which is hanging up in the rafters, because my father and another employee, Tom Brightman, were due to deliver it from Bristol to uh, uh, Detroit, to deliver it to the chairman of Chrysler. And they had to delay the trip one week so I could be born, so I feel a kinship for that. <laughs> and of course, this is the way these catamarans are today. We won't go into that too much, but of course, it's very fascinating what is happening in San Francisco. And here's our Hall of Boats where you are. And here is the story of the Centennial Yacht. So now, of course, one of the important ones, maybe the most important one, was the boat originally dubbed the Buzzers Bay Boys Boat, and it is the uh, 12 and a half footer, which is here, and here is one of them sailing. The company built about 370 of these, and since that time, a couple of other boat yards have made wooden ones, and several places have built uh, fiberglass ones. And my father, after the closing of this company, had a strong role in uh, the development of early fiberglass boats. He designed the first large fiberglass sailboat, which is owned by our friend uh, Steve Freire here. It's a boat named Arian, which is in very good condition, and still sailing. And he also made the designs of how the 12 and a half were built. These being called Buzzers Bay Boys Boats in the beginning was because they came about because when Captain Nat, along with the syndicate members of the Resolute uh, potential defender of the America's Cup were practicing in 1914. The uh, gentleman spoke to him about the need for a boat to train their young sons to sail. And Captain Nat, in his own notes, refers to it as a boat designed to be good to train these young boys to sail to prepare them for the much bigger boats that they would have in the future probably ones he hoped he would design also, and probably did. So I used to know a very wonderful gentleman from Boston, Davis Taylor, who was the publisher of the Boston Globe, and he told me how this class got going. They built, I believe, 19 boats the first year after the design was made in 1914. And in those affluent days, a lot of the gentlemen went Friday night on the train down to Cape Cod in the summer. and. Uh, uh, Davis Taylor's father wanted this class to develop, so all he did was he went through the train, and instead of asking anybody, he'd say, uh, Harry, you're going to get number four, and Joe over here is at number five. They only cost $420 for a complete 16-foot boat, rig, sails, uh, boat hook, paddles, everything. But I guess in those days, $420 was some real money. And that's how it started, and then they were very popular, and we are delighted we still use them for our sailing school here, and it works well. Well, now another class is the Newport 29s, and they have an interesting lineage. That's this class here. Uh, they only built four of them. One was wrecked in a hurricane, and three are remaining, and they're all well restored and doing well. One is owned by one of our museum directors, Chris Wick named Mischief, and um, they're derived from the model that Captain Nat made for O'Leary in his own personal boat. And if you look carefully, you can see that this model was for a keel centerboard boat made for the waters of Bermuda with that kind of a rudder. But when Captain Nat enlarged these proportions, slightly modified above the waterline, by a ratio of four to three, 
he came out with a boat that was uh, 29 feet in the water line instead of a much lesser number. And he made this little piece of wood to be the shape of the keel. And for years when this uh, set of models was in our home, that piece of wood was separate on the deck. But when I put the models on loan here, I decided it was a good idea and I glued it onto there with a uh, not too uh, secure glue, so if I want to take it off, I can. But that's the shape of the Newport 29. Well, one of these boats named the Dolphin probably won more yacht races than any other Harrisoft boat. It was owned by a great guy named John Lockwood who raced all the time, won the off soundings races. They gave him big penalties, he won anyway, and they gave him more penalties and went on and on. And a few years ago, after John's passing, the boat, in other hands, went over to Europe and sailed in Saint-Tropez, and she was the boat of the year there, winning all the races over there. So these are, you can see they're handsome designs. They're very much related to this boat, Sadie, that's uh, up that end of the room. And there's a picture of the Newport 29s uh, with their gap rate. And um, Adam and I have designed a modern version of this, which was built in uh, laminated plywood in Maine. Iolanthe, which is owned by another director of the museum, uh, Bob Yarrow. And uh, we're very pleased with this boat. It's got a good rig, sails well, and uh, has, if I do say so, a very uh, handsome and practical interior. And we think this is a great thing to do where classic boats are getting scarcer and scarcer, is to build respectable, uh, conscientious uh, replicas. And I think this sort of thing, as long as it can be done well, should be a practice in the coming years. You see how nice that cabin is with, uh, in the foreground, a little chart table in the box and a galley forward. And it's worked out great for the Yarrow family. And this is the, uh, uh, the area. This, according to my father, was Captain Nat's favorite hull shape. And perhaps you agree in looking at it that that's not surprising. See this beautiful bow, the hollow water line, and nothing extreme. Nice uh, light weight, so the middle section not too full and heavy, and then an easy run back. And these boats have won all kinds of races. There have been some replicas built. One of them won the Opera House Cup in Nantucket. And wherever they race, they do well. And there's a nice picture of the area sailing. When we, most of the boats here, as you may know, are uh, donated to the uh, museum. And of course, in certain cases, there are stipulations. In some cases, there are no stipulations. But both in the case of this boat right here, which uh, was donated by Toby Baker and his brother, and this boat, the uh, Buzz Bay 25, donated by uh, uh, Paul Bates, we're required never to sail them again. So they're here for your enjoyment, and I wish that I could sail this one particularly, but we never will. And this is a picture of uh, the 12 and a half footers in the uh, very beginning. The first boat was finished right after New Year's in 1914, and this is my father, Sid Harrisoff, trying out the first uh, 12 and a half footer. I suppose he never dreamed the company would make 370 of them and that thousands of others would have been built in subsequent times, but he would be happy to know that. And that's the model of that in uh, our model room upstairs. And you can see it's a very uh, fascinating, straightforward, uh, easy line boat. Now one of the reasons the Harrisoft boats sort of jump at you when you see them in a harbor with a lot of other boats is the elegance of the lines. And um, why is that? Well, it's of course Captain Nat's inventive judgment, but also it comes somewhat from the model technique because when you're making a model like this, a half model, one of the important things to do is to have 
a wooden batten, which is like a, a thin stick with a chalk on it, and you run the chalk batten over the hull and scrape it up and down, and it deposits chalk in all the high spots. So then the model maker, Captain Nat or Sid or myself, we plane off the chalk, and eventually there are no high spots. And that's one of the reasons these boats are also easy to build, because when you think about it, this shape, blown up by a proportion of 12 or 15 or 20, uh, means that the batten used in making the half model is in effect a model plank. And if that model plank, the batten, can go around the shape easily, so can a real plank, and so can the water sliding by it go easily without extra turbulence or drag. These boats were built upside down, and Dan Shea, who has a great shop up the street here, has the same scene in his shop, two or three of these sets of molds. And the curious thing is, of course, we always think of fiberglass boats as being much more rapidly built than, than wooden boats, but in the case of the Harrisoft 12 and a half footers, two men could plank this whole boat in one day. They had master planks that they copied and they put on this plank and then go do the one on the other side and back and forth. And by the end of the day, they'd have all the planks on there. It's just about the same length of time it takes for a fiberglass boat to cure. And they had really, I think it's fair to say, the first real production line. There used to be a legend, which I don't know that I quite believe, that, that Henry Ford came here to observe the production line in the Harrisoft shops as some input to his Ford assembly line. I hope that room is true, but I'm not so sure it is. And here's the 12 and a half, still racing today. They had the uh, world championship of the bullseyes at uh, Fishers Island last weekend. We're about as uh, presumptuous as the baseball is by calling it a World Series. Well, just to close, I want to show you, uh, just take a short time here because I've run over a little bit, I'm sure. But uh, we're having the greatest time now continuing to sail these boats. This is a view of a wonderful replica of the schooner Westwood, which is named Eleonora. And it's passing by a break in the buildings of, uh, oh, I'll get it back here, okay. This is, this is saint Tropez in south of France. And the Eleonora is coming in from a day of racing, coming around the corner of the fort to go in the harbor. And uh, this is an early uh, picture of schooners. And today, these replicas are built with just as fine an interior and details as was the case of these boats when built right here across the street. This uh, guy is named Tricky, and he climbs up the hoops of the mast uh, very sure-footedly, and then he works his way out on here, and he seems to be perfectly at home walking on the uh, uh, peak halyard of the uh, gaff mantle. Very important to have a guy like that when you're on a big schooner. There's a picture of them going along. Now here at home, we have a boat named Streaker. This is developed from what was a very famous class in Germany called Sonderboats, which had a very simple rule involving the uh, waterline length and the rig. And uh, they had a peculiar shape because of the uh, details of that rule. And at one point later on, both my father and my grandfather made models of what they would like a Sonder boat to be if they had no limitations on the rules. So in 1980, I built the Streaker, which is from the model my father built. And uh, it's 33 feet long, very low freeboard, and I keep changing the keels. It now has a modern fin keel with a bow. And uh, we raced this boat. Uh, I think this weekend we won a race from uh, the Fagari return race from Nantucket to Hyannisport.